Hello, and welcome to a lecture on biasing field effect transistors. My name is Steve Ellingson. Here's an overview of this lecture. First, we'll talk about self-bias for field effect transistors. Uh, and there's really two cases. The first case is when the gate source voltage is greater than zero, is positive. And I'll show you an example of that. And the second case is when the gate source voltage is less than zero. And I'll show you an example of that. Okay, so here's the gate source voltage greater than zero case. I'm showing you here a schematic diagram for self-bias for a field effect transistor. In this case, the field effect transistor is in the common source configuration. As you can tell here, the source is grounded. I have the input as the gate, as usual, and there is a DC blocking capacitor here, just to remind us that uh, we normally don't want DC to go out the input. And there's a blocking capacitor here, again, to remind us that the DC should not be going out the output. Uh, but these may or may not be required, as I've discussed in previous lectures. We have the supply voltage, V sub DD, uh, using the usual nomenclature for field effect transistors. We have a resistor in the drain path, R sub D, and the gate voltage is set by this current, I1, flowing the, through these two resistors, R1 and R2. Now, this is obviously very similar to self-bias for a bipolar transistor, and if uh, you're not familiar with that, you should go back and uh, refamiliarize, because the concept's very similar here. But uh, one small difference is, of course, that for a FET, the gate current is typically very, very, very small. So we need this kind of arrangement since there is no, or I should say very little, current flowing into the gate. And so instead we're using this voltage divider to set the gate voltage and thereby the gate source voltage. And then to remind you, uh, these blocks here are used for RF DC isolation to keep RF from going into the power supply. So the easiest way to show you how to do this is by example. In this example I'm going to use a, an actual transistor, the ATF54143. This is an n-channel enhancement mode p-hemped type transistor commonly used in, uh, in RF designs uh, primarily in low noise applications such as low noise amplifiers. For this particular transistor I'm going to choose a bias point indicated as I sub D equals 60 milliamps and V sub DS equals 3 volts. At this bias point we know that the gate source voltage is going to be plus 6 volts. This is something that we can get from the data sheet. In fact the bias point I believe is a recommendation from the data sheet. We also know for this transistor, and this is very typical of uh, RF FETs, that the gate current is less than 200 microamps. And we're given that the power supply should be 5 volts. VDD equals 5 volts. So now I've indicated the given quantities on the uh, circuit diagram. To start, uh, we simply assume that the gate current is equal to zero. It's very, very close to zero. Uh, obviously not identically zero, but Assuming it's zero will greatly simplify the analysis and let us get some initial numbers, which will probably be pretty good. Next step, make I1, this current here flowing in this direction, large relative to IGSS. IGSS is 200 microamps, as I indicated previously. So if we make it 10 times IGSS, that's about 2 milliamps. Now, there's nothing critical about this value. I could have used 100 times IGSS, or I could have maybe used 5 times IGSS. The point here is that we would like to create uh, what's referred to as a stiff bias. Uh, stiff bias is in the sense that this current is not very much influenced by whatever residual current is flowing in the gate. And if we make this current much greater than what's flowing in the gate, then small changes in what's going on there will not affect this current. So we refer to this as a stiff bias. So making I sub 1 10 times IGSS um, will uh, certainly achieve that. 
Now we see that uh, R sub 1 is given by VDS, which is this quantity here, minus VGS, which is this quantity here, divided by I1, right? Because the difference here is the drop across this resistor because this inductor is a short circuit at DC. And that gives us 1.2 kilo ohms for R1. So right away we have 1.2 kilo ohms as the value of this bias resistor. R2 then is simply VGS because that's the voltage drop across this resistor divided by I1 because to a good approximation all of this current is flowing also through this resistor because very little current is flowing in this direction. So from that calculation we get 300 ohms. So very quickly we have 1.2 kilo ohms for R1, 300 ohms for R2. Now we need the value for the drain resistor. The way to do that is simply circuit analysis. So V sub DD minus V sub DS is the drop across that resistor. I sub D plus I sub 1 is the total current flowing through that resistor. And so we get R sub D is 32.3 ohms. And that really completes the design of the uh, bias circuit, at least the resistors. Now note here that the choke in the drain path and the choke in the gate path are probably going to be required. And that's because if we have a typical RF impedance, like 50 ohms at the output, and only 32.3 ohms up here, uh, the RF is going to be roughly equally split between those paths. In other words, RF will be allowed up in the power supply. So we're probably going to use something here to increase the RF impedance. So the way we would do that is we would select an inductor value such that at the design frequency, the value of this reactance is large relative to 50 ohms. And similarly here, uh, we don't want RF to run up this way. Um, and end up uh, going to ground. So we would want to use this uh, inductor to increase the impedance looking up into that path. So summarizing, chokes in both the drain and gate path would likely be required in this design. Okay, now what happens if VGS is to be negative? This is a fairly common situation for field effect transistors. Well, if you have a negative supply, there's no problem. Uh, because you can simply use the negative supply to bias the transistor, the previous method works. However, what frequently happens is that uh, you either have or want to limit yourself to just positive supplies. Introducing multiple power supply levels increases the complexity and cost of the design. So we'd like to try to make do with a positive design if we can. So here's a scheme for creating a negative value of V sub GS using only a positive supply, using this schematic. And then in the schematic, what you see is we are using a resistor on the source terminal, and then we are hanging this network off of the gate. This works because there is essentially no current flowing through R1. Uh, there's no current flowing through R1 because there should be no DC getting through this cap and there's only negligible current flowing into the gate. So there should be negligible current flowing in this direction and therefore the drop across this resistor should be approximately zero. So if it's approximately zero then this point should be at zero voltage DC. So the gate is essentially tied to ground, whereas there will be current flowing through the source resistor, so there will be a positive drop here. So there will be a positive voltage at this terminal and a zero voltage at this terminal, and that'll make VGS negative. Here's the example. In this case, I'm going to use the ATF34143 end channel depletion mode PHEMT. It's from the same transistor family as in the previous example. But in this case, it's a n-channel depletion mode PHEMT that requires a negative gate source voltage to be used as an amplifier. In this case, the bias point will be 20.8 milliamps and 2 volts. And at this bias point, we are 
told that VGS is minus 0.25 volts. So we need the gate source voltage to be slightly negative. And we're also given that the supply voltage should be plus 2.5 volts. No negative supply available, so we're going to have to use the second technique. So here I've substituted the values into the diagram. We start off, as usual, by assuming that the gate current is zero. So there's no current flowing in this direction. We assume that the gate voltage is zero, again, because this drop is zero, because there should be no current flowing through it. We use KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law. Starting at the supply, we see a drop of I sub D times R sub D across this resistor. And then we see the drain source voltage, two volts. And then we see the drop across the source resistor, which is I sub D times RS, because all of the current that is arriving at the drain should also be flowing out this terminal. And of course, this capacitor here is simply creating an RF ground at the RF frequency. So we can neglect that for the DC bias. So we find that the sum of the resistances RD plus RS should be approximately V sub DD minus V sub DS divided by I sub D, which is 24 ohms. So the sum of the two bias resistors RD and RS should be 24 ohms from this analysis. VGS is simply minus VS, and that's minus I sub D times RS, which is specified to be 0.25 volts. So from this, we find that R sub S should be 12 volts. And then the remaining resistance to get to 24 ohms is 12 volts. So we find that R sub S and R sub D should both be 12 ohms. So now I've substituted these values, R sub D equals 12 ohms, R sub S equals 12 ohms. One thing left to do, and that's to choose R sub 1. And I've chosen that to be 50 ohms. Why is that? Well, this is recommended by the data sheet. Now, why does that make sense? Well, first of all, note the value of R1 isn't critical because there's no current flowing through it. So in principle, R1 could be any value. So when we have uncertainty about these kinds of things, it's always good to look at the data sheet. Data sheet recommends 50 ohms. 50 ohms is probably a friendly value to use here because in a lot of RF designs, you end up with 50 ohm resistors in other places. So it would be a part that would be appearing in other places in the design, and that would simplify the bill of materials. So again, there's nothing critical about this value of 50 ohms. 30 ohms would probably work. 100 ohms would probably work. 50 ohms is a value which has been suggested by the manufacturer, and that implies that they have actually checked this, although that's not necessarily the case. But um, there's no reason to expect it would not be a perfectly suitable value here. Note that the drain choke would probably be required. So we will probably require this inductor. And the reason is because if we have a 50 ohm impedance here, and only a 12 ohm impedance here, we see that there's nothing to keep the RF uh, from running into the power supply. So we would want to choose an inductor here that has a magnitude of reactance which is much much greater than 50 ohms at the design frequency so that the impedance looking up into this path is much greater than 50 ohms. Similarly this choke will probably also be required because once again 50 ohms is not that much different from 50 ohms over here. Now, I'll say once again, it's not necessarily the case that these are going to be 50 ohms. They might be 100 ohms or they might be 300 ohms. Nevertheless, uh, the conclusion would, would apply here. And if these impedances are much different from 50 ohms, then you may want to change the values of these inductances to reflect that. Again, the criterion is to make the impedance looking in to those bias paths large uh, so that the uh, RF is not tempted to run up in that direction. So one final question here is how would you select C sub S? Well the purpose of C sub S is to create an RF ground and thereby uh, hiding this resistor at RF. So the impedance of this thing 
should be much, much less than the impedance of this thing at RF. So you'd want to choose a capacitance here that results in an impedance looking in this direction, which is much, much less than 12 ohms. So that's the way you would choose this capacitor. Given the frequency, you would compute a capacitance that results in impedance looking this way that's much less than 12 ohms. That concludes this lecture on biasing field effect transistors.